<laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank you again for, for joining me this morning. I'm here with uh, one of my favorite people on the planet, Christian Northrop, who is a board certified OBGYN physician and a New York Times bestselling author and that has put an authority on everything that can go right with the body. That's amazing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, if we don't mess it up with too much testing. <laughs> that, that's right. Yeah. yeah. It seems like if we look for something wrong, we'll find it. Uh, that's exactly right. And we are now seeing that with uh, cancer screening. Mm. Um, Gilbert Welsh was one of, uh, is a professor at Dartmouth, and he's spent a lifetime studying the true biologic effects of cancer, the biology, but also what screening does. And he said, too often we find something you would die with, but ne ne mm. never die from. So wow. the indolent, what's called the indolent lesions, the ones that would go away on their own, we find those, they would be very, very, very slow growing. And, mm -hmm. and so this is a big problem with mammograms and also the PSA test in men, is then they find things that once you have a diagnosis, like with women, Mm -hmm. the, the diagnosis that's so awful is ductal carcinoma in situ of the breast. Mm. The only reason that we are, you know, seeing better survival from breast cancer is that we've moved the curve over. So these women weren't really ever going to have any problem anyway. Wow. Um, and nobody knows this. Uh, well, more and more people are knowing mm -hmm. it because the, mm -hmm. the word is, is getting out. And then there's all the radiation from mammograms. And I've been saying this stuff for 30 years mm -hmm. and now we're finally we finally have the data and a false positive mammogram will often cause as much distress as a diagnosis of cancer because wow. in your head you think what if right mm -hmm. so that's why I say I'm an authority on everything that can go right with the body <laughs> and how to make that your experience because what standard medicine does is it's just disease screening it's not healthcare. Mm. It's disease screening. When you mm. go in there, especially today, what are they telling you to do? Get four or five vaccines. <sighs> They're not saying, you know, it would be really good here if we could check your insulin levels and make sure that they go back to normal for at least 12 hours a day because that will really prevent something down the line. No, that's not wow. what we do. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, so it's interesting. You are. Uh, a minister's wife and yeah. modern medicine has become the church of mm. today. Mm -hmm. We've lost our faith in God and in a higher power and, uh, and uh, our higher selves. And we have instead put that power and the belief into the hands of medicine to save us. And let me just say medicine does an amazing job with mm. hip replacements and being run over by a bus and, <laughs> Uh, you know, the, the sort of uh, emergency room stuff does right. an amazing job of, of bringing us back from the dead. But in terms of how do we live day to day, does a terrible job. Mm -hmm. It just mostly just scares you to death. It, it really does. And yeah. then when I go to my uh, health care provider that I don't use because I use my holistic person. Exactly. That's what we all do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I, I sneak in for my whatever I have to do and, and they look at the chart and you need this much calcium and be, you're this age and thinking, but nope. look at me, you know. No, no. And that's the thing, the ageism of it. Mm -hmm. So you walk into a drugstore now and it's are you 65 or older? Now, Dr. Mario Martinez talks about cultural portals and how mm -hmm. potent these are. A cultural portal is a shared belief system of a culture that trains you what is going to happen after this. So the cultural portals are, oh, now you're a teenager, so mm -hmm. you're going to act out and drink and have wild parties at our house. Mm -hmm. um, now you're Look at women's magazines, how to dress in your 20s, how to dress in your 30s, how to dress in your 40s, what hairdo is appropriate now. You know, now that you're 50, you better cut your hair and mm -hmm. get a mom haircut and wear mom jeans. And these are cultural portals. 65 is a huge cultural portal. Wow. It was created, by the way, as the retirement age by, um, I think it was... Um, it was a German guy. I want to say von Bismarck, but that isn't who it was. But it was, Otto, yes, it was Otto von Bismarck in 1965, mm. 1865. 
as a retirement age so that the pensioners, the people who'd worked their whole lives, could have a couple years of rest before they died because the average age of death then was 67, 66, 67. Huh. Well, now it, it's up to, you know, like 82, 83. So, but we have this belief that entrains our bodies that at 65, it's time to hang it up. Huh. It's obsolete. There's no room for you anymore. And huh. so if you look at New York City policemen, the average cop is dead two years after retirement. Because wow. if you go into police work, your value system is, I'm, I'm doing something to protect and serve. Mm -hmm. What does retirement mean? What, you're on a, um, in a Gulf community in Florida, mm -hmm. or you're, um, you know, you're, you're sitting around barbecuing for your grandkids, but <laughs> where, where is the, the life there? So we need to re-examine every portal that's associated with an age. So one of my healthcare practices is never again to state my age. Huh. Just never, no, and we know, by the way, that chronologic age, the age on your driver's license, mm -hmm. and biologic age, the age of your actual body, can be really different. So you probably know 85-year-olds going on 40, yes. and 40-year-olds 40 going on 85, and uh, I recently was introduced with a, a man, uh, 94, in Canada, vibrant, fabulous, wonderful girlfriend. And so we said, what's your secret? And he said, don't hang around old people. Ah. <laughs> That's great. Now, what he meant by that doesn't matter what your chronologic age yeah. is. Just don't yeah. hang around old people. I've met old 25-year-olds mm -hmm. who bore me to death. Mm -hmm. They've already shut down, combed mm -hmm. down their life to... Mm -hmm well, this is the age I'm going to be when I get my pension or when I retire or I just have to work this much longer. And mm -hmm. it's, like, it's like a zombie has taken over their mind. Wow. Yeah. So what you want to do is continually grow and change. I still feel like I need to get fluent in Spanish. You know, <laughs> I want, that's one of my, my goals. I did uh, retake up the harp again. I had played as a as a youth, played in the Dartmouth Symphony during medical oh. school. And then, you know, I have this big concert, Grand Gold Harp, and, and then it needs to be repaired. And I finally said, you know what? How about you get a smaller thing that you can take outside? And mm. so I've completely redone my approach to music. So it's no longer the taskmaster classical training mm -hmm. of my youth. It's fun little folk songs that I can play in the garden. Yeah. Without, and I don't care who's listening. It's usually the birds. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's fabulous. I, it just seems like when when our mind is, we're as, we're, we're as old as we think we are, and the more we continue to bring in new things, is what I'm hearing you say. Is that it keeps us youthful, keeps us growing, keeps us in the mystery because we don't know it all. We don't have it figured out. I took up right, the plus. ukulele a couple of years ago, and kind of like you, it's portable. It's little. It's you know, if only the birds yeah. here, probably that's good. So, but I love it. Yeah, yeah. And, and we know that the hippocampus area of the brain, the memory center, keeps um, growing throughout life. So it keeps adding new cells. Now, when I went to med school, we were taught that the brain begins to lose cells at age 25. So, you know, like at 25, you reach, uh, what do we think in our culture, right? You reach your peak bone mass, you peak your, you reach your, peak uh, sexual prowess, you reach your peak looks, you reach, and so it, the way the culture has it is, it's all downhill mm. after say 22, 25. It's the dumbest notion ever. In women, we tell women that at age 35, they're infertile. And, and that only started when we began the, the uh, assisted reproductive technology, which mm. doubles the rate of birth defects, by the way, when you do re wow. uh, assisted reproductive technology. So mm -hmm. what, it's not that that's a bad thing. It's that when you talk women into a belief system, the body follows the belief system. Mm -hmm. So my whole work is to do the opposite of what modern medicine tells you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> what an uphill battle, right? <laughs> uh, well, it, ha it has. I mean, it has been an uphill battle, but it isn't anymore because, um, you know, I've stepped out of the place where mm -hmm. conventional medicine has a noose around my neck and I have to follow their rules. Mm -hmm. and, and for all the doctors who may be listening, you know mm -hmm. exactly what I'm talking about. There are wonderful mm -hmm. doctors who would love to be healers and have more than 30 seconds to ah. look in your eyes and ask you what's going on. Yes, yes. Yeah, I have ah. a good friend who worked at the Kaiser Group in Denver for years and she said, I am, I'm just uh, so glad to be out of there, but nobody is contacting me it's like when you're mm. in it you're in it it's a mm. system and you need to have another way to to think and I think when people go to the Mile High Church you've got another way to think it's a more mm -hmm. expansive eternal uh, power source that has no age yeah. and the more and then when you get all those people together right when two uh -huh. or more of you are gathered yeah there will you be also um that's an enormous power and so that's really good for health not to mention when everyone sings together yeah the the, the sine waves and it, it it uplifts the body yeah there's a an old story i once heard that the church in rome was punishing an order of monks and they told them they could no longer sing and the monks all began to die until they were ah. all all dead because the singing is uh, very good for health it, it is and i as you mentioned you playing the harp i would imagine holding that instrument up against you has to be so incredible it is and it's right yeah it's right against your heart mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. the vibrations through the sounding board mm -hmm. are right mm -hmm. there yeah yeah mm -hmm. every anything that we do like that that doesn't necessarily involve technology. Mm -hmm. Although I have to say, mm -hmm. you know, I put some of my heart playing on Instagram. So if anyone wants uh -huh. to hear it, uh, you can go over to Dr. Christian Northrup on Instagram and you can see a couple little, um, very short, because it's a short little window there. But <laughs> right. I'll take the harp out and uh, play a little bit outside. So oh, a couple of those are over there. Yeah. I'm going to take a look at that. That sounds okay, great. Okay, good. That's okay, good. Great. Good. Well, I'm so excited because you're going to be at Mile High Church on Friday, November 17th, and tickets are going fast, and I've been uh, calling my girlfriends, my mom, my daughters-in-law, trying to get my sisters uh, to fly out for this because it's just such an opportunity to be in your presence that evening, and I know you're going to really be speaking on your, your latest book, Making Life yes. Easy. I love this book. <laughs> I love this book. Can you, and this one is very spiritual in nature, and so I it was is. wondering if you might let us know the inspiration you had for writing this book and writing it at this time. Yes, yes. Uh, this, is a, this is a coming out of the closet book about what I've always <laughs> believed. It's like, I've always been this way. You know, it's like a transgendered individual who says, you know, listen, I've always been a girl. What can I tell you? Yes, yeah. I know I played for the NFL, but I've always been a girl. Um, <laughs> this is like, <laughs> this nice. is, uh, you know, when, <laughs> when I was 12, I was babysitting, and I begin the book with this story, mm -hmm. babysitting for a couple, and I saw a cardboard box of, that had come in the mail, small, and the, the words Natives of Eternity was on the box, those words, the title, and I couldn't stand it i had to open their mail and i believe me i'm like you know uh, not that person and um you know have never smoked i've never used marijuana not you know i don't drink wine not because i have a judgment i just hate the taste and uh, anyhow so i'm just not the person who would open someone else's mail i open it it's a book by flower newhouse of the christ word ministry in escondido california and it was her a book about angels and then the divas uh -huh. of the wind and nature and the angels of birth, the angels of death. And it was written also with pictures that an artist friend of hers who could see these uh, drew the pictures. A gorgeous book. I was so excited. I went home. I told my mother. She called the woman and her name was Gretchen. And Gretchen had been going to the Christ Word Ministry every year on retreat for years. And then the two of us would get together for brunch uh, about once a month, all during my teenage years. So she was a spiritual mentor for me. So, you know, dealing and knowing about the angels and all of that at an early age. 
has also given me great comfort because I had uh, two sisters who died mm. and um, my medical career was really uh, influenced highly by my childhood, mm. brought up on organic foods and all of that stuff with an aunt and uncle who were medical doctors, but very straight. When I went to medical school, my aunt sent me a book called The Nuts Among the Berries. And it was about, <laughs> about um, you know, those of us who were health nuts. Right. And my other, my colleagues used to make fun of my brown rice and, you know, <laughs> say that looks like maggots and all the oh, rest. Dear. And it, as long as I could be included in the jokes, you know, I was fine with it because I love the profession. I love my colleagues. I love what they're doing. I love that they're on the front lines of everybody's lifestyle, trying to put us all back together. Mm -hmm. um, but I also knew from a young age, because mm -hmm. of a sister who died mm -hmm. as an infant and another brother who had to be signed out against medical advice, I knew that medicine did not have all the answers. And worse, worse, uh, you're taught as a doctor, uh, you know, MD standing for medical deity, you're taught <laughs> that you know, you're not allowed to make a mistake and you're supposed to know everything. Wow. Mm. And it's and the training itself is um, it's abusive. It's like an alcoholic family system kind of mm -hmm. a deal. Yeah. Mm. Wow, yeah. that's really so, something. Yeah. Well, it's it's so incredible because in this book, of course, you do talk about angels and gosh, so many options that it's almost like the divine said, "You're going to land on Earth." And I'm going to give you all these tools. I'm going to give yes. you Mother Earth that's going to take care of you. And then the things you can't see and all of that. And it's like you put so many in this book. And it's such an easy guide to, to look in and really know and understand. It's just that, I right. Love this book. Right. And, and I wanted people to know that um, this spiritual belief is actually quantum physics. This isn't, this is science. We just have medicine's been a uh, Newtonian. It's been um, based on gravity, cause and effect, all of that. And we don't understand the power of a person. Yes. We have not had, we have not until fairly recently, had the ability to see in the brain the results of meditative states, mm. uh, the results of uh, ecstatic emotions. Mario Martinez talks about the causes of health. And the causes of health are uh, elevated cognition, um, uplifting thoughts, uh, exalted emotions. And then there's a third, which no one ever thinks of, which is um, righteous anger. And ah. righteous anger is interesting. And uh, he talks about Tibetan monks have a lot of diabetes, like way more than they should have. And it's because, mm -hmm. let's think about Tibet. The Chinese came in, raped the women, burn the monasteries, all of that. And if you're a Tibetan Buddhist, your belief system is you go to loving kindness, right? That's mm -hmm. where you go. Um, may all beings be free. May all beings mm. be at peace. Well, that's okay. But the physical body of a human does not let you get away with that. The, the physical mm -hmm. body, when you go right to loving kindness, instead of being angry first, when your innocence or the innocence of another has been threatened, you produce too much beta endorphin. It's a neurotransmitter that's morphine-like. And it increased if you're constantly there. Oh, it's okay. Everything's mm -hmm. fine. You've seen those people. I'm fine. Yeah. It's good. Oh, he's a good man. He yeah. doesn't beat me like that. Yes. Um, it, it literally creates a biologic state in your body of sweetness, of too much sweetness, mm -hmm. so that you have a, a higher risk of diabetes. So here's what Martinez teaches, ah. which I love. You allow yourself to feel your anger because your innocence or that of another has been threatened. You wouldn't say, okay, so if a guy is about to kidnap your child, mm. you don't say, oh, he must have had a difficult childhood mm -hmm. and um, let's mm. just send him loving kindness. Right. You beat the crap out of him. Right, right. Get away. Yes. You do that first. You can then go to loving kindness. Mm -hmm. You don't want to stay in righteous anger. That's mm -hmm. resentment. That's mm high -hmm. personality. That's hostility. That's a health risk. But you have to feel when your innocence or a boundary has been violated, you have to feel that emotion mm -hmm. that is there for a reason to protect you. Yes. And um, in nonviolent communication, which is um, Marshall Rosen 
Marshall Rosenthal, yeah, wrote a whole thing on nonviolent communication. He's got a whole inventory, it's on the internet, of all the emotions and the needs that they signify. So if you go to that database, and I know we mentioned it, I mentioned it in the book, you'll see um, these are what I'm feeling, sadness, concern, whatever. These are the needs over here that it signifies. We're mm. talked out of this in our culture. Get over it, right? That's like the nastiest mm -hmm. thing you could ever say to someone, get over it. Mm -hmm. Usually there's a hurt inner two-year-old or seven-year-old mm. who just needs your loving kindness, you mm. as the adult. It doesn't mean someone outside of yourself has to take care of it. They don't mm -hmm. use you, mm -hmm. but it's that little kid in you that is needing your attention because someone said to you, get over it. <laughs> mm. Wow. That's yeah. like somebody hanging up the phone on you or something. It's like yeah. a, a sudden yeah. stop. Yeah. Right. Right. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, I, I just, I, I, I love this book as well because it's um, so much for men and women. Uh, yes, it's true. Though, yeah. And so I'm, calling my guy friends too, to come out and hear you and to, to get the book as well. Cause it's, it's just such a, such a handbook for life for all of us, for anyone. And at any given time we can, we can pull on one of these and, and use it, whether we're alone or with someone, if you're broke, if you're rich, man, woman, yeah, doesn't it, it, it doesn't matter. You know, what's interesting is, you know, Catherine Ponder, uh, has, is my go-to author for everything. And, uh, one of my friends, one of my editor friends, just interviewed her for Unity Magazine. And she talked about trying to hire a secretary. And every time she'd hire a secretary, they would read her work on the dynamic laws of prosperity. They would suddenly begin to be prosperous and then they would not stay in her job, which I thought was <laughs> hilarious. But yeah. when you said this could be a handbook, it's like that. I also, for guys, I have a whole section on male sexuality, uh -huh. which I think is a, is a must read for men because uh, men need to learn how to own and operate their manhood. Uh -huh. And in the days of internet pornography, we're really, it's really having a very ill effect on uh -huh. relationships because uh -huh. of the addictive nature and the dopamine stimulation from online pornography, which is yeah. the opposite. It's the opposite of true embodied. Uh, sexuality. I have a friend who uh, works uh, in a diocese, a Catholic diocese, and his job is counseling priests to get them off pornography. Is Amazing, that right? Huh? Wow. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And he said, what I teach them is, he said, I'm not your spiritual advisor, so I can't tell you whether or not to do this. What I can tell you is, when you use pornography, the pornographers do not have your best interests at heart. So please, Use your own imagery and work a little harder, please, for mm. better imagery that's not connected to the dark forces that are creating this. Isn't that interesting? That is. <laughs> yeah, that like no judgment. No judgment. Yeah. Just, right. you know, you, you, can, you can fuel this from a higher vibration place and it'll be better for your health and your heart. Ah, I love that. Yeah. I love yeah. that. Yeah. You know, ah. You're just, you're, you're so great at, at pulling things like that together. It's like we can get so distracted by the world and by stress and by health and scares and all of that. Oh, yeah. And then bringing yeah. it back in is, is, is such a gift of yours. I really, really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I've been on the front lines of this for a very long time. And what's fun is, this is why, as, as Martina says, growing older is, in a, is inevitable. Aging is optional. Mm -hmm. So I call aging is the gradual deterioration of your mind and your body and your spirit. But when you're around vital old people that have sort of the library of living inside them, there's a light that shines out that's just intoxicating. Yeah. And we all need those role models like Maya Angelou. And, um, you know, we, we all need yes. that. And in this, this youth culture, um, although, don't you see it changing? I mean, I love that Helen Mirren was on the cover of Vogue. Yes. And, uh, you know, and, and Jane Fonda is now doing movies with Robert Redford again. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Frankie and uh, whatever. Grace. That, yeah. Grace and Frankie is yeah. hilarious. It's great. Well done. And it's, yeah, it's, so this is also happening. As the light is getting lighter, the dark is getting darker. 
So just pay attention to the light and understand how darkness works, but don't give it your energy. Don't mm. give it your emotions. Yeah. Yes. Yes, it's, yeah. it's, I always think about in a dark room, you're always drawn to the light. And Oh, that I love. I love that. And there is no dark switch, right? There's a light switch, right. but not a dark switch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't say turn on the dark. Yeah. No, no, there is a dimmer. We know there's a dimmer switch. <laughs> but we want to, um, you know, and I think so places like the Mile High Church is, is a place of light. And I believe, really I believe, that what you do there influences the entire planet. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it doesn't take um, less, it doesn't take more, more people really, it's half of 1% mm -hmm. will change the mm -hmm. collective. So when you think wow. about what you do every week at the church, someone who's connected to the light is thousands of times more powerful at mm -hmm. making positive change than someone who's always complaining and someone mm -hmm. who is, angry and fearful. Um, mm. I like to say that anger and fear and sadness and the negative emotions where people live, they're food for dark forces. That's how dark mm -hmm. forces live. Mm -hmm. And what's happening now, I mean, the fact that I'm coming to your church, you have a vibrant congregation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uplifting thousands of people all the time. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of in the, you know, in the middle of the country. I mean, a little west there. Yes. But that influences the whole country. And the dark right now is pulling out all the stops. I mean, if you look at mainstream media, it's fascinating. As an author, I was on Oprah, the, the talk show, 10 times. I had eight PBS specials. I've been on Dr. Oz. And, but at this point in time, the mainstream media can't even sell a book that's a sort of an upbeat book. Mm -hmm. they, it doesn't work mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. What's happening instead is things like this. So we're on this Zoom platform. You and I are connecting. Mm -hmm. We're not going through NBC or CBS mm -hmm. or CNN. We're connecting heart to heart, face to face. And then yeah. you have the ability, like I do, to reach thousands of people. So it's like each of us is our own antenna and our own broadcasting station. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, the power is now much more in the hands of individuals than it's ever been. And that's very exciting. It's very exciting. What a gift. We yeah. live in interesting times with interesting <laughs> opportunities. That's right. That's right. Right. Thank you so much for uh, sharing this time together. Um, I look forward to seeing you at Mile High Church and meeting you in person for the first time on uh, November 17th at 730 or 7 o'clock at the church. In Lakewood, I am. Th I'm thrilled to be there. Yes. And Thank take you. my place in the pulpit. To preach. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> okay. Amen. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, we will see you soon. Perfect. All Take right. care. Bye-bye. Uh -huh. Bye-bye.